Hello. Um, now, I've got something new that I'd like to try today. Um, there's an awful lot of you know, information, fear in the news about the novel coronavirus that's causing problems in China at the moment and me, uh, appears to be spreading as well. And I think that there's an awful lot of misinformation out there. Um, and I've had this idea that's sort of been percolating for a little bit about perhaps doing a, a, a video series entitled What's Going to Kill Me This Week? Um, the idea being that you know we take something that's in the news or something that's very topical at the moment and we try to unpick it and see you know what's the science behind it and how concerning it is to you know yourselves at home. And I think that the coronavirus is a really good place to start at the minute because I've had patients um, in one of the practices that I work already beginning to talk about some of their worries about this um, new uh, virus. So with that in mind, what I'm hoping is on this episode, we're going to um, have a go at looking at what um, we know so far about the virus what actually is this coronavirus and crucially how is it different from our common or garden but still deadly flu what can we um, do about um, the coronavirus ourselves and you know what um, you know information do you actually need to be furnished with to try and reduce some of the worry that people might be having at home sound like a plan okay so let's give that a go and I'm going to have a guest with me today. When I graduated from Warwick University, um, I went initially for my foundation programme as a junior doctor to work at the super hospital here in Coventry, University Hospital Coventry in Warwickshire. And it's a super hospital because it's a tertiary centre. That means it's got some truly excellent toys in there, you know, proper big league medical stuff. And that also means you get some big league doctors there. Um, not me, I hasten to add. I was very much the smallest minnow in the biggest pond there. But um, when I was there, I had to work on the respiratory wards. And some of the teams that work there tend to be populated by the most skilled doctors. One of the consultants there, um, Dr. Ravi Gowder, how can I... How can I give you a picture of what he's like? He's basically house, but nice. Um, and he did the infectious diseases there. So tropical medicine, dealing with TB, dealing with the really you know, unique and potentially nasty stuff. And he now runs a travel clinic here in Coventry, providing vaccines for people who are going off to travel to areas where they could be medically at risk but also dealing with people who have been exposed to some nasty and also helping get them the treatment that they need. Dr Gowder has very kindly agreed that uh, we could pop over to the travel clinic and hopefully we'll be able to you know, give you guys some information and just reduce some of the worry that's there. You know, we kind of want to be um, able for people to read something on you know, social media or on the newspaper and say, Actually, I know I have the facts. I know that that's just scaremongering. I know I don't need to be worried about that. What I need to do to protect myself in any case is X, Y, Z. And obviously, I don't need to explain that that's going to be washing your hands the first off. But we'll see if there's anything more that you can do than that on its own. OK, let's head over to Travel Clinic. Hi James, how are you? I'm very well, Dr. Gary. Are you well? Yes. Yeah, good, good. Well. Good to see you. Come on through. Perfect. Come on. Thanks. So, Dr. Gowder, thank you very much for um, having us here. It's all right, James. Um, and, you know, taking time out of your busy clinic. I do really appreciate mm -hmm. it. Not a problem at all. So, um, we've all seen the news at the minute with the, the novel coronavirus mm. that's in China. And, I, um, you know, we've been, there's a lot of information in, you know, online. And I get the feeling that some things are getting a bit distorted out there. So, 
I've had lots of questions that have come through from YouTube about the coronavirus. Mm. And with yourself being an infectious disease specialist, hopefully you can put us straight. Do you think you can help with that? Certainly. Perfect. Fire away. So, you know, let's, let's get your background on what's going on with the, the virus at the minute. Can you just sort of give us an update where we are? Yeah. As you know, there's a new virus that's emerged from China and almost certainly from the Hubei province uh, from a city called Wuhan. So initially the virus was called the Wuhan virus. We've got a proper name for it now. Uh, it's called COVID-19. And that's the official name by the World Health Organization. We think, you know, it may have arisen from a live seafood and animal market in Wuhan. Okay, so an animal transfer. Yeah, an, 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 we, we think it's an animal transfer, but we, we're not 100% sure, but probably. Probably, um, because we know uh, coronaviruses uh, exist in certain animals, and we know that other coronaviruses, like uh, the MERS coronavirus, that was there way back in 2012, 2013, uh, that's the Middle Eastern uh, respiratory virus, it may have come from camels, okay, possibly. And also there's the SARS virus way back in 2002, and uh, it's thought that, that came from possibly civet cats. Okay. Now, if I, if I remember correctly, mm. wasn't there an animal connection with Ebola as well? Yeah, yeah, uh, there is. Um, and and so we think that these viruses somehow cross over from species to species. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense because we've heard sort of each one of these outbreaks seems to sort of definitely come from an origin place and there's an origin mm. story with it. Um, in terms of what's going on at the moment there, there's a lot of worry about the number of people infected and also the death toll that we've got in China. Um, Ella Clare on YouTube has asked, why is the coronavirus highly contagious and able to spread far more rapidly, seeming than flus? Well... It's not that contagious, simple as that, okay? So we think, and it's probable, that the coronavirus is spread by droplets from coughing or from sneezing, or when people um, cough and sneeze and it sort of lands on, on, on what we call fomites, so tables or other surfaces, and people are in contact with that and then they touch their faces or, they, or, or their nose or their mouth, okay? It's not airborne. The coronavirus is not like that. In fact, it's probably like the common cold, which is not airborne. So, so uh, we, we have mentioned about people, you know, uh, wearing masks mm -hmm. and things. But correct me if I'm wrong, but my opinion is that a mask isn't going to do much to protect a patient from getting, you know, infection just walking down the street. But as you said, just that good hand hygiene, making sure they're washing their hands, potentially using alcohol gel, that's how somebody protects themselves from getting this, isn't it? Yeah, ab absolutely. <clears throat> it, because it's droplet spread, it's, it's often contact. They, they touch surfaces and then they mess about with their eyes or, or, or the nose or the, or the mouth. Uh, or uh, people who might have influenza or coronavirus will cough and sneeze over people you know, face to face like me and you are. So face to face usually means about a meter, mm -hmm. so about arm's length, all right? Uh, and that's when you get infected. You know, you don't get infected when you're walking down the street or walking through an airport. Okay, it's close face-to-face -face contact when somebody coughs or sneezes and when you touch. So when you wear a mask walking through an airport, you know, you're more likely to touch surfaces that are infected and then you're more likely to touch your face, your nose, your eyes, your mouth. And I, I personally think masks are worse and, and increase your risk of infection. Uh, particularly in that, in, in that context. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but they only have uh, a relatively short lifespan because they lose any uh, benefit at all once they've gotten wet with moisture, don't they? Particularly the, particularly the surgical masks. You know, the the um, FFP3 masks uh, last a bit longer, okay? Um, and they're, they're useful. I'll tell you when they're, when they're useful. They're useful for those who have symptoms, uh, to, for, the, for those people to wear it so that they can protect other people uh, so they don't infect them, uh, the virus to other people. It's also useful when you get a lot of spread of the virus in certain situations, and that's in a healthcare facility. And so, and so, so um, doctors and nurses and other healthcare workers should uh, wear 
personal protective gear. So go, uh, uh, gowns, gloves, masks. Okay, and that's when it's useful. For the ordinary Joe blogs walking down the street, it's not helpful and often makes things worse. That's really, really interesting. So people seem to almost have it backwards that the mask is actually potentially a risk factor. <clears throat> Um, I, I, I personally think so because you, you're messing about, and, you, and often people don't have to use a mask. You know, it's got to be correctly fitted. Uh, it's got to be the correct mask, for example. Uh, it's, got to, it's got to have the right filters, and the, the, usual, the usual surgical masks are not that helpful. Uh, and often people touch on the wrong parts of the mask, and therefore that has the potential to contaminate their fingers, and therefore they can infect themselves. What's really important is. Uh, simple hygiene that you would exercise for uh, the common cold and for f influenza. Okay. So in the, here, here in the UK we have um, the, the phrase catch it, bin it and kill it. And it's very simple. So you, you try and catch it with handkerchiefs or tissues. If you don't have that, use your arm if you need to. Okay, that's better than nothing. So that's the, the, the catch it bit. Okay, so then you bin it, you dispose of it properly in a bin. Right. And then you kill it with, you either use a, um, a alcohol gel or uh, even better, try and wash your hands. Good old soap and water. Yeah, soap and water, okay, for at least 20, 20 seconds. And, and, and these are important control measures to prevent the spread of the cold, the influenza and the coronavirus. And, and this is what you need to do. Okay. So, you know, all those people who, you know, I've, I've, I saw a picture recently, you know, people having a, a sale on dust masks. That's not going to do anything than make money for the person who's selling those masks, is it? I, th I think so. You know, like I said, often they make th things worse and they increase fear, they create hysteria, uh, but without much effectiveness. Okay, perfect. So Chaz has asked, how dangerous actually is this coronavirus? The news always makes things more dramatic than they are. How worried should we be about a mass global outbreak? Okay, the first things first, you know, news um, and news um, media are there to make things dramatic. Okay, and that's how things sell, you know, adverts, newspapers, etc. Let's take a step back and look at the facts. First of all, as I said, it's not that contagious. It's by droplet spread. Secondly, look at the context. Flu. Mm -hmm. uh, the World Health Organization estimate, you know, there's at, you know, at least three million or five million cases over, over a year. Uh, of an annual... I mean, we're always talking <coughs> yeah. about it. Someone's saying, oh, yeah. I've got flu, I feel terrible. It's not a, <coughs> it's not a rare thing, is it? Yeah, and, and if, it's very, it's very common, as you well know, okay? Uh, and, you know, we're both doctors. We, we, we see patients all the time with influenza and how common it is in, in the flu season. Um, the WHO estimate is about 290,000 to about 600,000 deaths per year. Okay. That's quite a lot, okay? That, that is a lot. But in the grand scale of things, that... <sighs> Um, if you like, if you like case fatality ratio, so it's the number of deaths compared to the number of cases, it varies quite a lot. It depends on the virus and the season, but it can be as low as 0.1% in a, in, a, in a modern healthcare country, uh, or it can be as high as 10% in, mm -hmm. in, in a year. Okay? Okay. And it runs somewhere in between, 3 to 5%. Now let's take a look at the number of cases that we have so far of the coronavirus. You've got, you've had about, about 50,000 cases and about 1,300 deaths, okay. Okay. approximately. Yeah. Okay. Because we're getting new uh, updates uh, every single and, day, and, aren't and we? Things are changing, and we, but we've got some data, okay? And we've got some case series, and that's less than 3%, so 98, 97 to 98% of people will survive, okay? It'll be fine. In the grand scale of things, look, flu is around, it's around every year, and it kills people. And both diseases, both infections, tend to prey on the more vulnerable uh, people in society. So the older people, people who might have a weakened immune system, or people who have other underlying medical conditions, so cancer, 
uh, or heart disease or lung disease. So um, actually the, the younger people have t tend to have milder disease. So, so most people will be fine. So actually thinking about this, perhaps all this press that we've got going on, which I, ask, I do think that people are almost being harmed from a health anxiety perspective, might actually prove to be a benefit if we can get more people taking up the flu vaccine, because we know that's going to affect more people. We know flu kills more people, right? We know it has other effects. It, it, you know, it, it, you're off work, uh, you, there's loss of productivity for a country, uh, kids go off school, and kids go and spread to other vulnerable people. So why not vaccinate when there is a flu vaccine? It's there, it's, it's cheap, it's simple, it's effective and it's well tolerated. Okay, now I, I come across this question so much at work and, and I do push it back, but as an infectious disease specialist, how would you respond when someone says, I don't want to have the flu vaccine because it made me ill once, it gave me flu. Well, that's actually an interesting, interesting question. And, and first of all, okay, the flu vaccine that you get is a killed virus, it's not live. So you <coughs> cannot get infected from this no. at all. Let's be completely okay. clear about that. I'll tell you what actually happens, I think. When you have a vaccine, particularly to viruses, your body produces um, a, a, a chemical called interferon. And that makes you just feel a bit run down, okay? But it's nothing compared to what you might get when you get proper flu. You'll have high fever, you'll be aching all over, you'll be bed-bound for a couple of days, and you'll be off work for, for about a week. So it's completely different. I mean, when, um, when I did my GP training, one of my supervisors, he said, oh, the best diagnostic uh, test for flu, you put a 50 pound note on the floor. If the patient can't be bothered to get it, you know they've got flu. That's not bad, actually. That's not bad. <laughs> because because it, it just actually, um, it makes you feel so run down, your bones ache, your muscles ache, you just can't move. Uh, you, you just can't move, okay? And you just you just take to bed. So that concludes the second part of this story about the novel coronavirus from China, and hopefully gives us a little bit more of the background and more importantly the science behind some of the slightly alarmist newspaper articles and um, online features you might have seen. I think Dr. Gowder has proved beyond a shadow of a doubt how knowledgeable he is in the field of infectious disease and hopefully his calm and clear information has helped calm some of the worry that people have had about this coronavirus. If you feel this video has been useful to you, please consider sharing the video so we can actually try and get more people involved about you know, discussing and learning about the virus so you can decide how big an impact and how concerned we actually need to be, which as Dr. Gowder is suggesting so far, we need to be aware of but there are bigger issues out there for us to be aware of in the infectious disease world. Well, have a good evening and we'll join you in episode three in a couple of days time. Take care.